Welcome to this episode of Mysterious Circumstances Podcast. I'm your host, Justin. This episode is an awesome one. I got to interview former federal prosecutor Dan Dorsky and former FBI agent Mike Campy about their book entitled War Against the Mafia, How a Prosecutor and an FBI Agent Devastated the New York Mob. It is a true story about two law enforcement figures who led some of the most relentless and successful attacks on organized crime in American history. I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with Dan and Mike about some of the details, how it all happened, a little bit about their background, and they also share some funny stories about their time working against the Mafia. If you are interested in the book, I have all of the information in the episode description. So, this interview is probably one of the favorites that I've done at this point. It is so interesting. And for those of you who are into the uh, mafia and gangsters, I know that you are. You're going to love it, too. So sit back, and I hope you enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Mysterious Circumstances Podcast. I am your host, Justin. And I am joined by two awesome authors, and you guys love this kind of content. I am joined by Dan Dorsky and Mike Campy, and one is a former federal prosecutor, the other one is a former FBI agent, and they are responsible for bringing down so many people in the mob. I was reading through your guys' credentials, and I figured I would let you guys introduce yourselves. Dan, would you like to go first? For sure. Uh, Thanks, Justin. And hello to your listeners. So yeah, I'm a former federal prosecutor based in New York, uh, focused on organized crime, uh, uh, prosecuted members of of all five crime families, the Genovese, Gambino, Bonanno, Colombo, and Lucchese at a fairly high level. Um, Partnered with Mike on on some stuff that uh, could be viewed as fairly historic. And I'm eager to share uh, much of that with you and your listeners. How about you, Mike? Again, I was an FBI agent my career. Uh, I did some white collar crime, some public corruption, but the majority of my career focused on organized crime. And I used you know, the skill set from doing white collar crime investigations in these investigations. And I addressed numerous members of all five families in organized crime with regards to the evidence I developed. And I enjoyed arresting them. My favorite movie I told Dan is It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart and the impact you have on other people's lives. So taking these gangsters off the street to me was uh, saving others from the treachery involving these individuals. And there were a lot of these individuals that uh, were arrested. Outstanding. And I was reading that you guys both got into this for very different reasons. Um, If we could, can you talk a little bit about what made you want to go in this direction with your career or even specifically just to try to take down mafia members or members of La Cosa Nostra? When I was in high school, math was my strongest subject and my guidance counselor thought that I should pursue accounting in college. And after about three years of that, I realized that this is not what I want to do in my life. I, I do remember my friends knew that I didn't particularly care for this. It just seemed extremely boring. And uh, there was a publication in either Newsweek or Time back in the day that cited the likelihood that college graduates were working in the capacity of what they studied in school five years after graduation. And so when they showed me that article, they laughed and I immediately dropped accounting. But I subsequently learned about a year later at a barbecue. My parents wanted me to meet somebody. They called me over and it was an FBI agent. And he basically described at that time that the FBI was interested in accountants and lawyers and that I should just go back and pick up the additional credits. I only had a few courses to take. And uh, if I was hired as an FBI agent, that I would not have to necessarily work white collar crime investigations or in the capacity of an accountant. You can work any number of things. So uh, that interested me again in college. I wanted to do something. I almost joined the military. If it wasn't for me playing rugby and wrestling in college, I probably 
would have went off to the military because of the accounting. It's just uh, there are factors that sort of overlap, and I just think it was meant to be. And I gotten uh, when I got in the FBI, again my first office was in Cincinnati, and I laugh because. In the book, there's some funny stories about that. One, I didn't know I had an accent when I got to Ohio. And and the other was the, the, they gave jaywalking tickets. And I hadn't heard of that since I was like six, seven years old. So there are some funny stories about it. I thoroughly enjoyed Cincinnati, you know, working there. But I knew it was just a two-year itch and that I'd get transferred to what they call a top 10 office. How about you, Dan? Yeah, so I grew up in, in New York City. It's it's kind of it was kind of an open secret that there was a mafia that was very powerful and very destructive. My uh, my father would talk to me about it from time to time. I also grew up tail end of the civil rights era where that was an active conversation around the dinner table and 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 I, and I, I just had this thought of the world has a lot of problems and I want to try to help and I wasn't quite clear about how to do that but I, I wanted to do something to try to make the country better. I also grew up in my bedroom reading Batman comic books, Superman, things like that. And I just had this completely naive view that there were good guys out there and there were bad guys and you could pick your side and maybe work on the side of, 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 of good guys. So that drove me to law uh, together. I also heard from my dad a story about a, an uncle of mine who had been victimized by the mafia and that made an impact on me because it made me feel bad for him, but also for others in that situation. And there were so many others who were just defenseless uh, against a very powerful and brutal gang and, and they needed support. So all that drove me to law school. And then in law school, I wasn't quite clear where I was going to go, but you know, something in this general area. And then Rudy Giuliani, who was at the time the chief federal prosecutor in New York, he came to speak at my law school and uh, he had done the commission case or was doing the commission case at the time, which was a takedown of, of, of the bosses of, of the families. He's also doing some white collar stuff and taking down corrupt Wall Street executives. And it just clicked for me there. Wow, there's a job where they will pay you to chase bad guys and help your country. And that became my focus. That is outstanding. And you have uh, actually tried more cases against the mafia than anyone else, haven't you? Uh, any other federal prosecutor? Um, there's no official box score or, or card, but I've, I've spoken to many others who are kind of experts in this field and nobody is aware of anybody who did more trials. And I'm not aware of anybody who did more trials constantly on trial when as a federal prosecutor, just from trial after trial after trial, I was just known as the guy you hand a trial to um, and won them all. Mike, you actually led some takedowns. So can you tell us about some of your bigger cases and um, probably, I don't know, some of the some of the people that you ended up, I guess, meeting in your days in the FBI? Yeah. So, again, I had a variety of organized crime cases. When I first got to New York, it was labor racketeering. I was assigned again when I was in Cincinnati. My white collar crime supervisor, when I had received my orders, asked me, do I want to work white collar? Because it was as though he was going to coordinate or facilitate a transfer to a specific squad or area. And at that time, the commission case was in the news. So I had asked, I said, you know what? It seems like organized crime could be very interesting. And so I'd be interested in that. And I was assigned to the New York division to a squad that at that time was doing labor racketeering investigations. So there was a lot going on at that time. As a matter of fact, the squad, basically, the case agent on the squad was addressing the arrest of the banana boss and underboss at that time, uh, Phil Ristelli and Joe Messino. And they were severed from the commission case and were prosecuted in the Eastern District of New York. And that was sort of an interesting. There's, we cover a lot of the details in the book. There were some search warrants conducted. I participated in a, in the, apparently it was the Movers Union, the corrupt Movers Union, Local 814, and they were attached to that indictment. And we had gotten information, the case agent, that they were uh, shaking down the members of that union to come to a bar on the west side of Manhattan to contribute to their defense fund. I offered, they were looking at how to do a search warrant. And I offered to go in as though I was just lost looking for buddies that I, I played rugby with guys that were from multiple states. Some lived in Manhattan. And this bar was set in a neighborhood that there weren't many bars. 
And so we just walked in, me and another agent sat at the bar and uh, the bartender came up, you know, at a point, gave us some beers and then asked if we're part of the union. And we're like, no, I play rugby. I got some buddies that I'm supposed to meet with. This seems to be the bar that they identified. Basically, the next three hours we drank for free. I got on the phone to call the squad to give them the information of what I was observing as part of the shakedown. There was a sign in the back, thank you for your contribution. There were overhears in the bathroom of guys that were pissed off that they were contribute had to pay defense funds for the guys that were ripping off the union. It was a very comical moment. And again, uh, it was an interesting time, but eventually the squad changed from labor racketeering to focus on a specific organized crime family. Initially it was the Colombo family. And then subsequently it was the Genovese family. I wanted a case of my own. I subsequently did research, opened an investigation on this individual, Nikki the Blonde Fristacci, who was an old time gangster. He was well liked by Chin Giganti and Chin placed him looking over this Jimmy Ida who was conducting in the capacity of originally the acting consigliere, but then it was officially the consigliere. And, and Nikki was the conduit to Chin regarding how Jimmy was conducting himself. So that was one of my favorite investigations. It was more complex because of the bureaucracy aspect of it. But it, it took a few years, and uh, Jimmy Ida is currently doing life in prison. And a bunch of people, the acting administration, Barney Belomo, this guy, Mickey Domino Generoso was the acting underboss. So there was a lot of details that evolved in that investigation that gave me a real sound footing going forward with other investigations. What made you go from Colombo to, to uh, the Genovese family? We became the Colombo family after, you know, when you do labor racketeering investigations, there's multiple overlaps with the various LCN families. So rather than arguing who gets to do what case, they just assigned us the Colombo family to investigate. And we have what we call control files. And so I wanted my own case. And I went back to the original volume of the Colombo family and just did a review of who the power was as it evolved. And I identified this Carmine Sessa and Bobby Zambardi as two guys that I wanted to focus on. Carmine Sessa became a very valuable, well, very respected associate to soldier, to capo, to the consigliere of the Colombo family. And they were involved in a war. And eight months later, our squad changed to Genovese and they took three agents and, and placed them on a squad where the Bonanno family was being investigated and the supervisor were overseeing two, two LCN families. So I started the same process with the Genovese. And that's where I focused on Nikki DeBlonde. So it was sort of an eight-month window. I thought I had a good focus. I had cooperator into CESA. You know, there was a lot there, but, it, you know, it was like starting over again. Dan, for people who do not know who the Chin Gigante is, you had some obstacles, right? I mean, can you give a, can you give listeners like a brief overview of why this guy is... I mean, I don't want to say smart, I don't want to say stupid, but he is one of the more interesting bosses and the longevity of him as well. He came from the old school and he lasted a long time as a boss, but I don't think people understand a lot that he, basically he acted like he was crazy all the time. I can't recall specifically how many years he would put on that act, you know, he'd be shuffling around in the streets, but can you talk a little bit about how all that came about and some of the obstacles you faced with him? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's so much there, but from 50,000 feet up, uh, and then we can zoom in, if yep. you like, Vince Giganti, known as the Chin or the Odd Father, was the boss of um, uh, the Genovese crime family, which is one of the five families in New York. It is um, recognized as the Rolls Royce, uh, for lack of a better term, of, of organized crime. It's the most powerful criminal organization in America, most secretive, most formidable, most uh, respected and feared. And he was the boss of that crime family for decades. The technique that he used, which is straight out of a comic book. I mean, yeah. it's, it's absurd. <laughs> I always viewed it that way. And yet it worked. It, it kept him out of jail for decades. Was he simply uh, stated that he was crazy? 
he had psychiatrists, I'm sure some on the payroll, some who he fooled, because it's it's very hard to tell if somebody's fake. His daughters actually come out and said he used to just watch TV shows and he'd mimic what he saw on TV. And he just kind of dribbled at the mouth, walked around Greenwich Village in pajamas and um, acted like he was nuts to law enforcement, to agents, to prosecutors. It was absolutely apparent that this was all a silly act. But the psychiatrists who were the so-called experts on who is actually crazy and who isn't testified by, I don't know, the dozens that it, was, it wasn't an act and that it was all real and real and all legit. And it worked for him for year after year after year after year after year. Uh, and, and he started that act, uh, by the way, I think it was in the late 60s, um, uh, early 70s, when he'd been arrested for bribing the uh, the police department uh, in uh, Old Tepan, uh, New Jersey, uh, where one of his families lived. I say one of because he also had a second family on the Upper East Side of New York that lived in a mansion there uh, or a townhouse. So that's who he is, what his act was. And then in terms of obstacles, yeah, for, for law enforcement, the, op, the major obstacle, it, it, was, it was really three obstacles. One is this, overcoming the psychiatrists, the so-called experts who said he's crazy and judges have to defer to that to a degree. Uh, second obstacle was if you said his name as you and, uh, you and I just did, Justin, uh, there was a death sentence for that. So it was known if you say his name, you will in all likelihood be killed for it. So mobsters were very, very careful not to say his name. Sometimes they mess up, but very, very rarely. And the third major obstacle was his absolutely utter paranoid uh, secrecy. So whereas your listeners are probably familiar with, sometimes mobsters get captured on tape. The chin did not get captured on tape. He was he was intercepted in wiretaps in the 80s. And it was like uh, listening to a chimpanzee uh, sp- trying to speak English at the zoo. You'd hear things like that. He just make guttural noises because he suspected and he was right that the FBI was listening and very hard to put a case together with all those obstacles. Funny thing was the two wives both had the name Olympia. What's the really? chance of that? Yeah, that was what was unusual when you found, you know, the second wife, they're both named Olympia. I mean, I don't know anyone named Olympia other than Chin's two wives. Did the two families know about each other? Yeah. They oh. came to know each other. Yeah. All right. And very convenient for him because he could call either of the women and not yeah. have to work. <laughs> Absolutely. Dan, I, I noticed uh, also Sammy the Bull Gravano brought up. I have have done an episode about him. Very interesting guy. I'm not a huge John Gotti fan. I think if he would have not been so egotistical, I think he probably would have been a lot more successful. That's just my opinion. Tell us a little bit about the guy who was supposed to kill Sammy the Bull. Yeah. For sure. And and just to your point, yeah, there's a, there's a capo in the Genovese family, a guy named, I think, Angelo Prisco, who was captured on tape saying exactly what you just speculated to, Justin, which is, he says jo- John Gotti destroyed organized crime because yeah. he, yeah, uh, and he couldn't stop talking. So, um, yeah, so both Mike and I had uh, several interactions with Gravano that I think fairly interesting, fairly fascinating, which we could turn back to if if, if you like. But um, to answer your question, uh, yeah, Gravano had cooperated against Gotti. He uh, had uh, been originally in the witness security program, had left that, had moved to Arizona. And it became known through his interview with Diane Sawyer and other uh, things, it became known that he was there. And the Gambino family sent a hit, hit squad to kill him. The leader was a guy named Huck Carbonaro, who was a soldier in the Gambino family. And I prosecuted Carbonaro for trying to kill Gravano. And the most fascinating part of this really fascinating story, which obviously we cover in detail uh, in the book, is that Carbonaro called a star witness to defend him against the charge that he was trying to murder Gravano. And do you know who that was, Justin? Mm -mm. He called Sammy Gravano. (laughs) So Gravano took the stand to say, the prosecutors, the FBI, they have it wrong. Carbonell wasn't trying to kill me. And so I am the only prosecutor to ever cross-examine Sammy Gravano. <laughs> I try to prove through his testimony that he was wrong and he actually was the intended murder victim. I'm sure that situation has never occurred in any other court. <laughs> I highly doubt it. <laughs> Those three dangerous words in that life is, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> How did you guys get uh, George Barone from the Genovese family to end up become a witness? And how did that all play out? Being the, I mean, Genovese family, super secret, super powerful. And in order to get a witness out of there, you had to have had some kind of dirt or tell them, you know, somebody was trying to kill them or something, right? And again, there's a lot of detail in the book, but I think that's a perfect story as a foundation to the hypocrisy of that criminal life. Yes. I mean, George Barone, we made numerous recordings of how he basically was instrumental in the Genovese's control of the ILA, the International Longshoremen's Association, on a national level by controlling the board. And this all happened, and these are recordings we made, this all happened when they were transitioning from loading the ships manually to the containerization process. And again, historically, the shipping industry in New York, you had the ports in Brooklyn and Staten Island and the ports in Manhattan and New Jersey. But when it went to containerization, the property along the Jersey coast was substantial for the storage of containers and for ships to come in while Brooklyn and Staten Island had minimal space. And so in that capacity, the new unions that were created with George's organization skills that facilitated that work for containers, repairs of containers, you know, basically loading them, that was all George. And they were complimentary of George. And this is what I found fascinating. George went to prison and he was owed money by an individual, a modest amount of money, like $60,000. But he facilitated, because George went back to the days of Vito Genovese. He was there back in the days of when Costello was shot. He was with Vito Genovese. When he went to prison, he facilitated Chin's son, Andrew Giganti, to handle this associate of the Genovese family in that industry. That guy was a multi, multi, multi-millionaire as a result of George facilitating his opportunity to get the business. And he owed George a modest amount of money, like $60,000. When George tried to collect it after coming out of prison, the people affiliated with the Genovese family that were dealing with George didn't want to ask Andrew. They didn't want to insult Chin by going through the process of collecting. Now, to me, having played sports, you know, with guys on my team, you want to do your best to support your teammates. George made them millions and millions of dollars in this corrupt industry. Why not just give them 60000 out of your pocket if you don't want to embarrass Chin? And yet, George, being a very stubborn, fearless guy that was in numerous, in World War II, he was at Iwo Jima, in numerous battles. He didn't back down, you know, and he basically demanded his money. And so they were interested in killing him. There was a bunch of things going on at that time. Uh, we had a bunch of murders that were lining up that we had to address. And so George was charged, you know, as part of our original indictment. But George's stubbornness, I think, and his ability to find us credible with assisting him in addressing his cooperation in an efficient manner. And Dan did an excellent job on the debriefing process there where you establish a comfort zone from a credibility standpoint of you're working with us. Did he trust us to do what we said we were going to do to assist in this process? And Dan can speak more about that. But I, I think thinking about the modest amount of money that he was asking, you didn't have to go to Chin to get it. You could have did it out of your own pocket. So, uh, Justin, let me uh, set the table for you and your listeners from a very high level. So the Genovese crime family, one of the reasons why they're so powerful and successful is they do not have made members. That's a technical term, which we can turn back to if you like, but it means essentially you have a lot of power. A made member of uh, organized crime from the Genovese crime family, uniquely, they do not become witnesses. So the, the only Genovese made member to ever speak publicly was a guy named Joe Valachi, who testified in Congress in the 1960s. We're from the Gambinos. You have Sammy the Bull Gravano and others, um, uh, Lucchese. You have Al Diarco, Pichotto, uh, Banano, you had their boss, Messino, and others. 
Uh, who am I? I'll leave it out. The Columbos. We list. We oh, list them in the book. It, uh, yeah, we list them. The Genovese uniquely had nobody other than Valachi since the 1960s to fully cooperate. Mike and I, after George Barone was arrested as part of Mike's massive takedown of the Genovese family, we had the opportunity to actually meet with George Barone. That in of itself also never, ever happens. When a gangster gets arrested, they are assigned a lawyer whose first task is to make sure that they never meet with us because the mafia doesn't want their people to become witnesses. So they prohibit their people from meeting with us. You never get a chance to meet with a mobster unless they affirmatively reach out to you. They, what they usually do is they ditch their lawyer and they get a lawyer who will actually represent their interests to approach you. That's like how Gravano did it. Al Diarco came walking to the FBI offices and so on. So big picture, uh, nobody from the family cooperates and you never get to meet with them anyway. What happened with Barone was Mike and I traveled to Florida as part of this massive takedown, which we can talk about separately. And Barone, because Mike Campy succeeded in getting so many mobsters arrested, we're talking 50, 60, 70 of them, the mafia didn't have a chance to assign their lawyers to keep their mouths shut. So George Barone actually got a lawyer who represented his best interests. And that guy saw that Mike and I wanted to talk to George. You know, we said it to him in court, hey, would, can we talk to George? And he said, yeah, of course you can, which is what... <laughs> A lawyer should do. They're obligated to represent their client's best interests. It never happens in mafia cases. Mike and I stumbled into gold. So we actually were in a meeting with George Barone. And we and, didn't argue for it to his attention, which he, I think he appreciated that. Yeah, he, he also he was appreciative uh, uh, that we didn't seek to keep him incarcerated after his arrest. In the book, we take you into the room and we show you how the conversation went and how we were able to persuade him. It, it's one of the very few opportunities ever that uh, an FBI agent and a prosecutor has an opportunity to persuade a, uh, a gangster. Usually they've already made the decision, then they come forward. But Mike and I, between the two of us, you got decades of a lot of experience in turning criminals into witnesses. And Mike and I each made the decision, we're not letting this guy leave the room. He's just not getting out of here until he becomes a witness. And we succeeded. Um, we were very fortunate. And he became the first made member of the Genovese crime family to cooperate since Valachi in the 60s. It was devastating to organize crime. It broke. Oh, yeah. Others started to come forward after that. Uh, and since then, there have been some others. Um, but uh, yeah, and he was a legendary historical waterfront character on top. And of we were receiving information from sources on the street, like these old time gangsters like uh, Chinky Fasciano did not believe George cooperated. It wasn't until obviously he appeared and he, he's on video being interviewed. But uh, very fascinating, very bright guy, George Barone, as far as his knowledge of the ILA. I mean, he cited, and again, the book has a lot of details, but he would cite how he travel out to Kentucky to kill a guy interfering with the Genovese gambling operation and then continue to travel out to meet with shipping executives to discuss the union uh, agreement. And his memory was just sharp. And you could tell he was fearless. Wouldn't it be more beneficial to not have them confined? Like you were saying, he he appreciated the fact you were trying to let him get out or bond out of jail or whatever the case was to like be back on the streets. Theoretically, wouldn't that be a good thing? Because they're going to go out maybe... It all depends. Okay. So George Barone, historically, when he was in Florida, he developed a lot of the union port. He facilitated the ILA unions with Cubans. And the Cubans loved him. And so it was really a Cuban population. He didn't go into the witness protection program. He relied on his friends in that community. And I remember part, and again, we go into it in the book, but the source that we were operating in the book, Durso, he was a person that was supposed to be tasked with actually killing George Barone. And so they were giving George a portion of the funds in Florida and then they were going to summon him to New York for the remaining portion where he'd be killed. And I, again, we go into the detail. It's sort of comical in some regards because I was sitting in this strip mall covering it all by camera and video. And I was watching George with a big smile on his face, counting the money behind the driver's wheel. And the whole thing was for Durso to be there to observe it so that he knew 
who he'd probably be killing in the future. That is interesting. A lot of details, though, in the book. Oh, absolutely. George had a great sense of humor. <laughs> well, I guess that is always a good thing. How did you guys end up meeting and working together? I am kind of interested in that. Again, I didn't meet Dan initially, but I did go attend the first chin trial he was in okay. to observe. And I had uh, the Ida trial completed, I believe, at that time. And I went just to watch to see how it was evolving. So I got this uh, a sense of George Santangelo, Dan, and Andrew Weissman in that trial, just observing it as a, in the courtroom. I subsequently met Dan when the case was about to come down and that Dan was assigned. And so it was a process of, there was going to be numerous, we anticipated numerous trials. And so that process of the arrests of the proffers, Dan was all part of that. You know, he went to Florida with me. So it was a good connection where there was a comfort there. And Dan was uh, very good on his feet with, you know, coming across in a credible manner. Because a lot of times guys don't trust, you know, a guy from the street just may not trust in proffers how they evolve. And it could just be because they're not speaking in a comfort zone. To me, when I speak to guys as far as cooperating, whether it's in an informant capacity or cooperator, it's I'm telling them what I'm going to do. It's the credibility that what I'm saying to them, they trust. Okay. And so... There's a lot there, but uh, Dan had a very good rapport when we sat with George Barone. What do you think about that, Dan? As, as Mike had seen me in court in the first chin trial, I had always heard Genovese is Mike Campy. Like that, that's just what I always heard in the Eastern District. We would prosecute Genovese, Gambino, Colombo, Lucchese, Bonanno. It didn't matter. But I had always heard if there was a Genovese case, it was Mike Campy, and, and I was aware that he mostly brought the cases at the time to the Southern District of New York. So I was, I was frankly, thrilled when, when I learned that I was being assigned to a Genovese case where Mike was involved. And then, as Mike said, uh, so in the takedown that Mike orchestrated, this powerful takedown that we've alluded to, Mike and I did the Florida part of it. Most of the arrests were in New York. Mike and I did the Florida part. So we got to know each other got to learn that, you know, we respected each other, trusted each other, were able to turn Barone into a witness. And then Mike approached me to say, hey, can we take down the chin a second time? And then we partnered on that. When you got your name out there, Dan, were you ever, I mean, you had to have been fearful at certain points during a lot of this. Is there anything that stands out to you as like a point where you thought to yourself, hey, man, maybe I should like back off or, or not do this? I'm whether it be for the safety of you or your family or anything like that? What we were always told, and it made sense, was just do your job. The mob will leave you be because they understand in some sense that you're fungible, mm -hmm. which means if you kill a prosecutor, another prosecutor is going to step into their shoes. And guess what? Now you got roaring front page headlines. You've got United States Congress is going to potentially step in. You've got, you know, politicians who are going to jump on this. The mafia thrives by living in the shadows. And this makes them top front of the page news menace to a law abiding society. So that was what kept us safe. Uh, that being said, you know, I have colleagues who were threatened from time to time. Um, it's always in your mind is a possibility, but you understand, you know, at some level, somebody's got to step forward and do this. Otherwise, what's going to happen to society? I mean, we may as well just uh, become a, a lawless uh, society where the criminals take over. Yeah, one other thing, Justin, from a business standpoint, guys, the street agents, the competent agents I work with and from other law, NYPD, DEA, the reason we joined this is to take bad people off the street. We're not fearing somebody trying to retaliate against us. One, we're much better shots than they are. But the other thing is, if I get a threat, I'm going to the guy's door. I'm not waiting on it. They get life in prison for murder conspiracies. The other aspect is they jeopardize their own life because it's counterproductive to business to generate money. It's against their own rules. Because I remember when the DEA agent, Hatcher, Everett Hatcher was killed. All law enforcement basically stopped what they were doing. 
it was almost like 9-11 and focused on going after Gussie Faraci to get him. And I, I, I remember the debriefing of Al Arco, who was the acting boss of the Lucchese family at that time. After he cooperated, he cited how he went to a kid's house like at midnight, one in the morning, knocked on the kid's door, handed him a gun. He said, kill Gus or kill yourself. They knew he was hiding him. And shortly after that, Gus was killed. It, it, it's really, they know we're going to raid. We don't typically raid social clubs for gambling operations or something. But if we're looking for a fugitive and you raid the social club, you're going to come away with guys' parole violations. You're going to generate numerous informants and cooperating witnesses based on your aggressive pursuit of somebody that killed a law enforcement officer for doing his job. What was the hardest case and what was the easiest case for each of you? Oh, wow. I mean, there's some cases where you just get a walk in <laughs> being extorted and it's like, okay, let's go make some tape. I mean, you can't, it's like a layup. I, I had, there's some funny cases. I remember these Russians who operated a limousine company and it's a big limousine company now, but they appeared because they were two guys that started the business along with an Italian guy. And the Italian guy was like a dispatcher in the cab service. So he's very familiar with the streets in the city and all, and he could direct them. And as this company was growing, this Italian guy basically was sick, colostomy bag and all his stuff. And apparently he wanted to get bought out. And he introduced to them on the phone an alleged cousin who was portraying himself as a gangster. And it was one of the funniest conversations I made because the Russians appeared at the FBI because they were threatened. Their lives were threatened. Guys appeared at their office, put guns in their heads and demanded that their partner get paid, the Italian. So they showed up at the FBI and I made recordings. And the recordings were with, you know, the, the person who was a partner. But then they put his cousin on <laughs> who just came across like hilarious. And I'm writing script of what I wanted to ask, yes, but who are you? Who are you? And it was like the, the cousin on tape, it's one of the funniest conversations. You want to know who I am? I'm the fucking devil. If you don't pay my fucking cousin, and it just ballistic went, <laughs> by tomorrow, I will fucking kill you. Uh, and it was just one of the funniest conversations. And so a few hours later, we go out to make a meeting where they think they're getting paid, and we arrest <laughs> them all. And the guy, the Italian that had the colostomy bag, had a semi-automatic in his pants, safety off, down towards his groin. I mean, we could have pulled it out. It would have accidentally went off. You couldn't make this stuff up. And as I'm driving away with him in the car, him being an Italian and Campy being an Italian name, the Russians are in the parking lot. And he's telling me he wants to fucking kill those guys. Mike, you're Italian. I'm Italian. They're fucking Russians. I couldn't. And I'm testified to this at his detention hearing after the fact. I mean, it's a funny story. I don't know if the details, I, you can't make it up. And I remember years later, agents who came to my squad heard the recording in their new agents training class. It was hilarious. You know, it, you can't, it, it, it would be something that would be funny in a movie. And one of the guys arrested was so big, he was cuffed. And his head in the back seat sitting, but his head was in the front seat. That's how big he was. He was and, it, and the hands were behind his back. And he wasn't the brightest guy. And I remember when we took him out of the car at uh, our building to process him, his hands were like blue. And I said, are your hands? He didn't tell us that the cuffs were so tight. They were on the last, you know, cinch. His wrists were so big. It's just... Funny story, even if he wanted to cooperate, you couldn't use him because he was as dumb as a stone. I mean, <laughs> how about you, Dan? Yeah, for me, uh, so I had a chance to think about it more um, as, as, as Mike was talking. So I, I would categorize it. I would say the easiest cases are the guilty pleas. You know, 95% of all cases are resolved through a guilty plea. I had the somewhat unique experience of many, perhaps most of my cases were actually trials because I would take the cases that were going to trial 
you know, my boss would seek me out and say, hey, Dan, this case is going to trial. I want you on it. So those are the hardest cases. I mean, the cases that go to trial, because if you think about it, I'll put you in this in, in the seat that the prosecutor occupies. All the defense needs to do is convince one juror, just one, and you don't get a guilty verdict. And the defense attorney's entire job is essentially to follow you around everywhere and attack everything that you say and everything that you do. Look for holes to pick any hole and pry it open as wide as possible. And then they or your witness, right? All they need to do is find one inconsistency, one thing that can't be proven, one thing that they got wrong. And the skillful defense lawyers, and I usually were again, I, I was up against the most skilled defense lawyers because that's what the mob gets. They make a mountain out of a molehill and will scream to the jury that you have to reject the whole case. So, and again, all they need is one juror and there's no guilty verdict. So it's, it's a really intimidating um, uh, environment. That being said, the two hardest cases from that hard group, one, I prosecuted the acting boss of the Colombo uh, crime family, a guy named Andrew Mush Russo for, uh, for attempted jury tampering in the trial of um, his son, who was prosecuted for multiple murders in the Colombo War. That was the hardest, uh, one of the two hardest cases for me because uh, I was I was a fairly new prosecutor at the time, and the defense lawyers were grouped together to just tear me apart. It's the closest I ever came to breaking uh, at trial, and I and I explain why in detail in the book. But it was it was a harrowing experience. I was up all night, virtually every night. I, I just kept a, a, a pad of paper by my bedside. I'd wake up at three in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning, just jotting down notes, trying to rebut the attacks that I was experiencing on a daily basis. Many of them below the belt. Uh, and the second uh, that I would say was the hardest was uh, prosecuting uh, Joe the German Watts, who was a very trusted associate of uh, John Gotti. When John Gotti killed Paul Castellano, he deeded Staten Island to Joe Watts in as 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 a thank you for helping him kill Paul Castellano. So Joe Watts took over Staten Island. I prosecuted him along with a fantastic uh, other prosecutor, uh, Andrew Genzer. And we prosecuted him for uh, money laundering and tax evasion because he built this massive estate in Sarasota, Florida, with the millions of dollars that was being funneled to him through Staten Island. That was uh, the other hardest case because we got one of the nastiest surprises that could take place. Uh, as a prosecutor, you're always trying to control the flow of information that gets to the jury. And then you still have to deal with the attacks and the uncertainty of how the jury's going to uh, take it in. But when your case doesn't go in as you expect it to, that's another level of anxiety that uh, that can really take you to a whole nother place. So those were the two hardest. All right, we're going to stop here, take a little break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. And uh, we touched on it a little bit earlier. We were talking a little bit about hypocrisy, especially with the different levels of between soldiers, capos, bosses. Uh, I saw a quote. Somebody said um, they're just soldiers. We just use them or something to that effect. Associates. Uh, yes. So how like. I don't know. When you guys are looking at a case or looking at the people involved, I guess, what stood out to you? Because you always have the stereotypical, it's loyalty, it's all about the family. What is some of the more hypocritical things that you guys have ran into while while doing this? I do think the book points out, historically, the hypocrisy of the life. Going all the way back to the days of Lucky Luciano, when you had mm -hmm. Joe the Boss Messeria. Yeah. And the Castle of Maurice Wars. So you had Vito Genovese, Lucky Luciano, you know, Frank Costello. You had all these guys who were under Maserio and Salvador Maranzano, who was on the adversary and the enemy of Maserio, conspire with them to kill Maserio and then allow Lucky to take over his business and all. And within months of that murder, that they successfully completed, Maranzano then uh, planned to kill Lucky Luciano because he, he became envious of how others were viewing him. And so that's always viewed as though it's the foundation for this men of honor, when the reality is it just continued over the years. I mean, besides the World War II, which sort of you know delayed the, 
hypocrisy. And I'm sure there's a bunch of murders I'm unaware of with regards to the treachery and the life. And again, there is no honor, love. Those three words you hate is I love you because that's the guy who's going to shoot you. The reality is that they have egos. They envy each other. It's sad. I mean, you're joining a group of men in an organized crime family that may have 100, 200, 300, depending on the time frame. But each member, each soldier has associates attached to them. And the recordings we made in the conversations that we cite in the book spell out how as soon as somebody steps away from a conversation where they're all supposed to be splitting money, they'll talk about hating the guy and what a moron the guy is. And there's so many similar type of conversations where you realize, and these are recordings we made, where a wise guy is supposed to love another wise guy hates him. And they've got these egos where, for instance, some of the recordings that we cite in the book is how one guy is one of only two people that's allowed to visit the acting boss in prison. And he's sharing this with an associate that we're recording. Nobody's supposed to know this. And it's just like you can't keep a secret because you've got this big ego and you want people to know how important you are. And those are the types of details that I think if the guys in that life realize the recordings that law enforcement has, I think the recordings facilitate guilty pleas because they never want them played in court because they don't want the people in their life to realize, you know, how they basically were more interested in their self-serving issues than really your brotherhood. And okay. I use that to facilitate cooperators, informants, because they're aware of it, some of them. And really, if you love your kid, you basically would want him to not get involved in the life, maybe get him a job in some other capacity. And so that's what I want to get across in the book is the hypocrisy of the life, because the wise guys in the life know it. And mm -hmm. it's just they can't step away from it unless they want to cooperate. <laughs> Or too old and they can sort of retire. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the reasons, Justin, that Mike and I decided to come forward. I mean, there, there are a lot of complex reasons why we decided to, but th this was one of them to try to help correct the public record as to what the mafia really is. There's there's almost this massive misinformation campaign uh, for, for various reasons uh, that gives the public the misimpression that this is a life of loyalty, honor, and and respect. And it's just absolutely absent. And unfortunately, the young men who, who make the decision to go down this path, by the time they find out, it's too late. And we do our best to show, not through argument, but through compelling facts, the type that Mike has talked about, uh, these recordings uh, in the mobster's own words, uh, like Tommy Caffaro's one Genovese guy who Mike can't be uh, had recorded. Uh, and these are his words. He says, this life is all treachery. It's all hypocrisy. So we try to give a lot of details of that one for the benefit of the public and two for the benefit of the young men who may make the mistake of their lives and, and get caught up. And by the time you're caught up, you have two choices. One, you cooperate or two, you get killed um, if, if you want out the life. So we're trying to protect them from making that mistake in the first place. To give you a concrete example, which you asked for, maybe the best illustration that I can think of, of the uh, life of hypocrisy and treachery is this person who we've alluded to throughout our conversation, a guy named Mike Cookie Durso, who was the consummate gangster, tough, respected, on his way to a leadership position, had muscle, right. brain power, everything, but he uh, was playing poker one day with his cousin who was like his uh who was who was like his brother and they um were shot in the head both of them and the people who orchestrated their assassination were their friends friends to the degree that these people who orchestrated their murder attempt were at Mike Durso's wedding just months prior to that so if you want like the ultimate example of hypocrisy and treachery when you have close friends who you're sitting down to play a card game with and then they shoot you in the head and they kill your cousin and uh, they put a bullet in, in your head. And then the treachery and hypocrisy extend through his example because he sought revenge, which 
he should have the right to do. But his own crime family came back and said, if you try to get revenge, we'll kill you for it. And then later on, he got into an argument with a guy on the phone. And Mike Durso did what a stand-up gangster is supposed to do, is he represented for the Genovese family. He tried to put the guy in his place. It turned out he was arguing with, he had no idea, the acting boss of his own family, because the Genovese are so secretive, a guy named Frank Farby Serpico, who didn't identify himself. So Durso did what you're supposed to do as a gangster. He stood up for the Genovese, and the acting boss was so offended because his ego got in the way that he decided Durso had to die for that. All of these things are what ultimately pushed him to Mike Campy so Mike could work with him. Those are really good examples of just hypocrisy and treachery in in, in organized crime. Kind of reminds me of the uh, Sonny story. I mean, he did, what, 50 years in prison and he gets out. And I believe it was his own son that that rolled on him to save uh, save his own ass. I think he had like a drug charge or something like that. Dude went back into prison at I, I can't even th- remember how old he was. I think 90 years old. He went back into prison and did like a few more years and then got out again. And it's like, man, like, uh, <laughs> Francis, yeah, John Francis, yeah, that's a rough situation. Uh, well, um, I would, uh, one more I thought of to add to this, uh, Justin is, uh, Mike Campy with Mike Durso recorded powerful mobsters saying that when somebody does what like the son did in this instance that you're talking about, mm-hmm. or, a, yeah. or a Diarco or a Gravano or, or Chodo or, or other very powerful witnesses, they do it because of the hypocrisy and the treachery in organized crime where they've been abused for doing nothing wrong. And then they decide, you know what, if you're going to abuse me and I didn't even do anything wrong, I'll work with uh, the FBI. And, uh, and, and that's not what Mike is saying or me. That's what the mobsters say on tape. Yeah, you had Sammy V. Ball Zapparo recorded saying that. And there were others talked in recordings we made about how John Gotti ruined the life yeah. because of being so open out in the public. And really, the old timers wanted to be low key, at least the more sophisticated ones. And, you know, it's evolved, the, the, that life, I, I sort of think. And, I, I, you know, we speak about it in the book, I believe, about, you know, how. Italians, when they first came to the country, any ethnic group, you stay amongst your own. Mm-hmm. You don't typically trust law enforcement because of the country you came from is law enforcement experience. And so it sort of evolves. You borrow money. You can't go to a bank. You borrow from somebody that has money in the neighborhood. But what I would like to think of as it evolves, your silver spoon kids that come don't always treat people the same as maybe their parents did and it just becomes a much more uh volatile ego uh, assaulting people abusing people where it helps facilitate cooperation to by, with law enforcement to address these issues uh with uh, arrests yeah. convictions in some instances discreetly without you know, using informants to put bugs in, but now it's become much easier because you see the hypocrisy of the life and you've got so many cooperating witnesses now. And it's a, it's a, you know, allows others to cooperate. The, the gangsters know this, the public doesn't, but the gangsters know about the hypocrisy and treachery. Many, if not most, if not all uh, gangsters sleep with guns under their pillows or beside their bed because they're hyper aware that uh, it's treachery. It's all hypocrisy. And that's that's what always struck me as interesting about the Gravano case too, is because that dude was so loyal. It was crazy. And then he hears the, you know, tapes of Gotti, you know, talking about talking about him. And then when they were in jail on that indictment, I mean, essentially Gotti said, Hey, you're gonna take take the rap for all this, you know, and he's like you know, fuck you, man. You know, you just, you know, I just heard a bunch of recordings about you talking shit. So here's how it's going to go. And to be able to have one of the most loyal people just turn because at that point, you know, he's like, this is all bullshit. You know, this is, I I always found that interesting. Yeah. Well, it's thing- almost always the most loyal, the, the, the strongest, uh, you know, Gravano's one example, Al Diarco was the acting boss of the Casey yeah. Villain. didn't want to be a witness, but they tried to kill him. Fappy Chodo is a great example. He was as loyal as you can possibly be, but they shot him 13 times. He's five that. He still didn't cooperate, Justin. 
<laughs> then they threatened to kill his father and they took all of his property. He still didn't cooperate. Then they put a bullet in his sister's head. Finally, he cooperated. Crazy to me, I guess. I, it's hard for me to conceive, you know, coming from my background, which is, you know, out in the middle of nowhere country and stuff like that. But I mean, obviously, there's certain forms of loyalty, but... Yeah, that's why I've always kind of found that interesting. It Justin, you'll get a kick out of this. Because in the book, again, when I said I didn't realize I had an accent, uh, <laughs> yeah. I went, and there's some humorous stories in the book, but I had to go across to meet a investigator with a bank that had a fraud that was committed. It was like 8.30 in the morning, and this guy had like a Barney Miller that tied down as though it was like midnight, cuffs, you know, on his shirt up, and he pulled out a bottle of, of whiskey asking me if I wanted a cup of coffee. And I just thought I'd only <laughs> been there recently. I was just out of the Academy. This is guys breaking the new age in stones. And I said, no, I had my coffee. And then no sooner did that sentence end when he said my name, my campy. Is that one of them dare Italian names? And I said, yeah, campy's Italian. He said, anybody ever tell you, you talk funny. <laughs> you couldn't make it up and I just thought it was breaking my stones and it was like when I told the guys weeks later this bank had a bank robbery and he was out there and I was pointing to guys on my squad you know responding I said you guys ever deal with that when I told him the story because I thought it was the old timers in the office that were just trying to use him to screw with me they just burst out laughing and eventually months later I would joke when they People would talk about, is that a New York accent? I said, no, it's not a New York accent. It's an attitude. It's a Jersey <laughs> attitude. And they would just laugh. It was it was funny. I enjoyed the two years in Cincinnati. That's awesome. So speaking of like funny stories and like the book, you know, kind of goes lighthearted at times. With all the stress, all the sleepless nights, frustrations, what is a case or an instance uh, with what you guys have done over the years where you were just super proud of yourself and just super happy? It's like, you know what? This is why I do what I do. Is there one in instance that stands out? I wish I had that moment. I mean, the Ida case was what I was most proud of, but I really banged my head against a lot of bureaucracy to get it done. I so appreciated the assistance I had. Uh, by other agents that worked with me on that, you know, it, it and my prosecutor, because I really, I just had some upper management that just was problematic to getting things yeah. done. So I don't, the things that made me most proud were really coming from the street. I mean, I remember the squad adjacent to us had a guy from Bureau of Prisons finally joining this joint task force. And this was a big compliment because I was introduced to him and he looked shocked that you're Mike Campy. And he goes, you don't know how many times I've heard your, your name mentioned on prison calls. Like, and he cited a specific call, a recent call where the collect call to the guy outside cited that I had knocked on his door, the guy on the street and visited him. And the guy in prison said, Hire an attorney and plead guilty. He goes, he hasn't charged me with anything yet. Hire an attorney, but I'll see you in a few months. So that was a very, you know, something I viewed in a complimentary manner. I just sort of giggled. And and he was surprised because he was thinking of, you know, a big full head of hair like John Gotti, an angry Italian. <laughs> just, you know, a comical moment for me. I said, are you disappointed? He just laughed. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, I, I would always try after trials just to kind of like have have the recognition that society was a little bit safer. You know, people were a little bit safer. Potential victims were a little bit safer. And that was what kept me going. But a specific moment was uh, after and, and Mike could tell you he had a similar experience um, after uh, the conviction of uh, Joe Watts. I was sitting at my desk, I don't know, a day or so later and the phone rings. This was before, like, phone numbers showed up on, on your phone. And it was a really gravelly voice that quickly told me this was not the type of call I'm used to receiving. And I can't really mimic the voice. Maybe I'll try a little bit. But it was like, uh, yeah, yeah, you are you, 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 you,
brace myself a little bit for whatever was coming. And I go, uh, what do you, you know, what do you want? And he goes, are you the guy that just convicted Joe Watts? And I go, yeah, the trial, the trial's over. And, uh, I had no idea where he was going, but what he did was he thanked me. He said, uh, he said, Watts was uh, going to get out. He had a, a, a list of hits that he was going to carry out and that I had saved a lot of lives. And that just meant a lot to me. I quickly put on, you know, investigator slash prosecutor hat. Like, hey, you know, let's get together at a diner somewhere. <laughs> but th- then he hang- he hung up the phone. That is pretty I wild. Have, That's pretty awesome. Again, yeah. another similar call I had. But in the Ida case, I had lost num- my favorite supervisor, you know, was replaced. I had partners, detectives. One was indicted and was acquitted at trial regarding corruption, and another one retired because of what was going on. I had another partner, Bob Doherty, a really great agent, and he just left organized crime because of the frustration. So when that Ida conviction came down, we went out after with the prosecutors to have some beers to celebrate, but I had this empty feeling, and I called Patty Maggiore, the detective that retired prematurely, to say I wanted to thank him for his work, the case would have never, uh, the trial would have never gone as well as it did had, but for his participation, even though he didn't testify in the trial, we worked together, we did a bunch of different things. And I just felt empty because of the guys that were involved initially. I felt good with the guys that were involved at trial, and, but at the same time, there were so many missing parts. And I felt good for the prosecutors, but I didn't get that same joy. It was more of an empty feeling looking back on what occurred in that investigation. And Mike, all uh, on the Mickey Generoso. Yeah, I got a call from an unknown person who basically was so happy who convicted Mickey Generoso was the acting underboss because of his evil nature. And he never, I don't think he was ever previously arrested. He was old. You had actually mentioned earlier a little bit, you kind of glazed over it, and I was I was going to ask about this. You had mentioned like some of the um, upper management uh, making things a little bit hard for you at times. I mean, can you elaborate on that at all? I mean, I don't want you to give like a whole lot away, but how, how did that all come about? I, I mean, it's difficult to talk about because it, I understand the difficulty of trying to put listening devices in social clubs and other areas. I just had a lot of times, you know, where I was, you create a a document that basically identified the best window of time because say Mondays during football season, you know, they were gambling, they were watching football, they were there at three or four in the morning. So, you know, the break-in in Little Italy and Mulberry Street is a complex process. So I appreciate the frustration but some of the things that occurred could have easily been avoided. The purpose of my communication to the tech team that does the installation was to alert them of things to be aware of. So there were things that I was getting information. I mean, one of the bizarre things was a bug was installed and I got an information from a source who said that there was a, uh, the FBI broke into the Jigglies Club uh, last night at three o'clock uh, in the morning to install a bug that they caught. And I, this is a bizarre story. So I remember, you know, when I saw this communication, it wasn't my source. It was just a source that went into the control file. And I read it and I went back to saying, they know we put a bug in there. And the tech team, one of the bosses basically said, they didn't get caught. And I said, here's a source that's not only describing the night that it was installed, but it, all the accurate details. It was the FBI, I said. It was three in the morning. It was on that night. So why are you saying the source is wrong? Because the whole thing is you're going to be sitting there monitoring a bug or bugs with multiple guys sitting around on their shifts. And if if they know the bug is there, they're not going to be talking. And so that process, the funny thing was years later, I learned the guy Durso was the guy that caught him. It was, and he told me the details of how he caught them. And I was, he just was driving up Mulberry Street and he saw the lights on in the social club with the shades down. And he thought the guy in there was having sex with a girl. So he knocked on the door and he could see people scurrying behind the shades. And he was like, well, this isn't normal. And then he saw a car with a 
obviously an agent sitting in it, probably had an accent similar to yours. And he asked him, <laughs> what are you doing? And he basically said, oh, I'm waiting for a guy. He asked him who, because he knew the neighborhood. And when oh. you can't come up with a name, that's when he drove off and he basically called other guys that the FBI is in the club. It was just, I mean, it's comical when you hear it years later. And when you, you know, when you're looking at the faces of the people, you say, I think we got caught. Well, why would you think that? They said they didn't get caught. <laughs> just like the specifics <laughs> of the information. So there are some humorous stories. That's hey, all right. Hey, Justin. Um, yes. Mike, Mike has talked about Ida, Generoso, Paloma. Mm -hmm. Can I just put it into context for you so you're listening? Yes, absolutely. Understand the import. So this is a Genovese crime family. Uh, Mike took down their leadership. He is the only agent, to my knowledge, to have ever done that. And he did that in what he's referring to as the Jimmy Ida case. So he took down their acting boss, who was Barney Bolomo. He took down their acting underboss, who was Mickey Generoso. And he took down their consigliere, which was Jimmy Ida. That is the ruling body for the most mm -hmm. powerful criminal organization in America. After he did that, what he hasn't told you is... When he started his next massive investigation of the Genovese, a pretty powerful acting capo named Sammy Meatballs Aparo was captured on a recording that Mike made with Durso saying, if we take another hit like we did last time, meaning in the Ida case, we're done. We can't survive another hit. That was when Mike was starting the second hit. With <laughs> it it in the biggest takedown of the Genovese family ever. To the degree, not only the Genovese, all five crime families, to the degree that the FBI made an official statement on Mike's second case, which we've spoken around, but we haven't directly addressed. Uh, they referred to it uh, as perhaps, and I, I think I have the words exactly right, quote, the most significant and successful undercover operation in the history of law enforcement, close quote. So you're not talking just the mafia. You're not talking just New York. This is the entire history of American law enforcement. That's the magnitude of what Mike accomplished. That is honestly impressive, super impressive. And that's why I'm going to, if people need to read this book, I and mean, the book, hands sites, down. the book sites after that, I was looking to put in for an organized crime desk, but the boss, the ASAC basically at a, process to review the applicants for an organized crime supervisor position said to five other people that were participating in the review process where you have a list of candidates and they rank them that as long, and this was a guy I butt heads with and, you know, basically was able to succeed without his input. He said, as long as he has anything to do with it, Mike can't be, he'll never get a desk in organized crime. And so my family always wanted me to go back to white collar crime you know, that was just a head scratcher. And I did leave OC to go back to uh, to public corruption, white collar crime, and then subsequently was recruited to come back as the OC quarter. So you can't make these stories up. It could be a sitcom, but it's, it's kooky on so many levels. It's just honestly impressive that you got so deep into it and were able to accomplish what you did. What time span did, was this all happening in, like over a 10 year, 20 year span? I got to New York in 85. The Ida case was indicted, uh, but it took a while because of numerous issues. But he was indicted in, in June of 96, and the trial was in 97. Eight months later is when Durso reached out to me to cooperate. And so at that time, I was looking to maybe leave OC to go to do something else. It was uh, time to work Durso. Our cooperation was supposed to go from, uh, again, it was June to December. And we were supposed to address the guys who murdered his cousin, shot him in the head. And these same participants had roles in bank robbery, some of them. And so that's all we were supposed to address. But as we made recordings and we followed up on the details of the recordings with additional details, Mike Thurso was extremely a street savvy, bright, tough kid. And we... At a Christmas party, he got to meet the power in the Bronx. And as a result of meeting the power in the Bronx, which is people around Barney Palomo, who I previously put in prison, who was in prison, it was like, okay, let's pursue this. And it was three years. And we did so many different topics 
criminal topics, so many different organized crime families, schemes regarding, you know, multi-million dollar type of schemes where you would block the sewer outside high rise buildings and make a million dollars on the weekend based on coordinating with the engineer in the building who was corrupt. I mean, check cashing schemes where you had a check cashier that would basically facilitate millions, tens of millions, hundred million dollars in stock fraud type schemes. So there were so many schemes that it was like, okay, how do we get the evidence? How do we facilitate? And a load of these were where the people were talking about, nobody's supposed to know about this. And they would share the details with Derso as we're recording them. And it's like, okay, this is another thing we got to get on. I mean, there was an Albanian massacre that they were talking about. We had to take the case down because that was wild and it was too volatile. And they were talking about taking five members from each family. So total of 25 with fully automatic weapons to just go into these clubs to kill them. And it was like, you know, you're going to have innocent people, you know, as part of it. If you saw Sammy Gravano's uh, conversation when he described the killing of Paul Castellano, Mm -hmm. he cited that if innocent bystanders tried to interfere, they would have been killed. So this thing about the only kill people involved in life is not true. You know, not close to true. Yeah. It's the recklessness of it all. So, Justin, you're talking around a 20-year period. He starts in 85, first takedown 96, second takedown 2001. By the time the trials are all over, you're talking around 20 years. Yeah, nice. there's other investigations I worked on between, you know, the takedown. Yeah. But, yeah. I got some uh, questions from some listeners if you guys want to answer some. Is oh, that wow. all right? Absolutely. All right. Well, so uh, this is for both of you. What mob-related crime stuck with you the most or a case that still haunts you to this day, whether it be solved or one that you couldn't solve? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. The, 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 the first part of the question for me would be uh, the attempted murder of Patricia Capazola. She was a, a law-abiding PTA president, you know, mom of, 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 of children, just living her life and an assassin puts a gun to her head and pulls the trigger. And by some miracle, the uh, silencer fractures, uh, causing the bullet to misfire and she survives. And so I prosecuted the guys who, uh, who tried to kill her. And that was in retaliation for her brother, who was a gangster, uh, Fat Pichotto, uh, for his potential cooperation. So the, uh, the crazed, murderous leadership of the Lucchese family assigned that murder. That's probably the most haunting. Uh, And then the second part of the question for me uh, is just that despite all the really accomplished work that we were able to do and so many others in law enforcement, mafia is still out there, still five crime families, still disrupting people's ability to live peaceful, law-abiding lives. And that's very frustrating. So I pretty much was successful of investigating and convicting the people I focused on. I did have some bureaucratic issues. I remember catching a guy coming into one of the guys I focused on when we became the Genovese family was a guy, a capo in Bensonhurst who was involved in narcotics, active coming in from Italy. And I caught a guy coming into the country with two keys of heroin. And I remember a narcotics squad in the, in, in, on another squad came to seize my evidence. It was bizarre. It was all the politics, internal politics. That sort of was a frustration for me uh, because again, I wanted to travel and I had approval to travel to Italy on information. Another guy was going over to get additional kilos of heroin. And I thought if I'm in Italy and I can follow him, I can show a meeting with the capo in Italy, photograph surveillance, put him on a plane and just stop the plane when he comes back into the country, because I didn't think he was going to come back into JFK or LaGuardia, that it would be another area and figure out his transport. So that said, that sort of frustrated me. But the one thing, there was a guy, Red Hot Gentile. He was evil to me. He was the devil. And I knew from singular source information that he hated law enforcement and he built his own silencers and that he would kill law enforcement in a heartbeat. And I came close to making a recording with Derso with him because he used to be over in the First Avenue, 10th Street neighborhood. 
And I had Durso ask about him with Sammy Meatballs, and he's partially described, oh, he's a treacherous guy, and he was going into a murder, and then they got onto another topic. And I always wondered if I could circle back to pursue that, because I knew this from the Ida case and the Versace, how treacherous and evil the guy was. But he's dead now, so. And he lived close by to me. He looked like the Java man. He looked like a caveman. And, uh, you know, I knew he hated law enforcement. I did a surveillance, and I remember him squaring the block and getting behind the agent's car. And I had to tell him over the radio about the details of him hating law enforcement. If he gets out of his car and approaches your car, shoot him because he's just evil. And he's going to shoot you because, you know, just look for him going for a weapon because he was not the – not to be trusted. Nikki the Blonde originally proposed him to be inducted. Really? And the sign of disrespect is there was another guy, Handsome Jack Giordano, in that neighborhood. And because books were closed, Handsome Jack said to him, look, if you want, I can make him the Gambino family. And when Nikki heard that, and I remember Nikki's old school, you know, he shook his head yes when I said, you got, how loyal is your guy? And he realized that he wasn't, but he, he didn't, Nicky never would cooperate. He was old school and, you know, he went back generations. It could have been for whatever reason, but he did agree that he, Red Hot wasn't a guy to trust and wasn't loyal. And uh, that, that actually kind of leads into the next question I have. So sometimes when you look at mobsters, I mean... I've, uh, like I said, I've done a lot of episodes on, on certain mobsters and it's, it's funny to me that, uh, because I've been in the true crime area of the world for a long time, like nobody ever really considers like hit, hit men as just complete fucking serial killers, like psychopaths. But then you also have mobsters that you look at who are super intelligent and you would not think it's like, what are you doing this? Like you could be running, you know, you look at Al Capone. You know, he could have been a CEO of a company, you know, the way he ran uh, the outfit and stuff. He was, a, he was a good businessman. So the next question for you guys is the one mobster that stands out to you, whether it be because he's a complete psychopath or you just you expected more from him, you know, like a, a different lifestyle. Who is the one mobster that stands out to you and why? person that stands out to me historically, and I cite this in the book, as a sophisticated gangster is Jerry Katina. And he was the low-key boss for the Genovese family. And Jerry Katina goes back to the days of Lucky Luciano and others. I mean, he stood out as being a very bright uh, businessman. And so there was there's always treachery in that life. So as far as that type of gangster, I don't think it exists today. I mean, the brighter guys to me are low key. I remember making recordings and details of Chucky Tuzo was a capo in the Genovese family who turned down an acting boss position because he preferred to be low key. I think those are brighter guys. Um, for me, the chin, just because he was such a mythical figure and had such a ridiculous defense that worked. So he outsmarted the system for so long. And and then the other reason why it's responsive to your question is because actually when he was sentenced in his first case, the sentencing judge said to him exactly what you just said, Justin. He said, had you chosen a different path, your skills and your brain power and your organizational ability, you'd be running an S&P 500 company. Uh, you'd be the CEO. Why did you choose this horrible path? Um, essentially, that's what Judge Weinstein said to him. So it, I was reminded of that when you were asking the question. That is, uh, and I mean, it's true. It's so it's so wild to me that you have these super intelligent individuals for the most part. I mean, you got some pretty big dummies out there too. But it just, it it's crazy to me to think, you know, if they just would have taken a different path, what would happen with some of them? You know, you look at guys like Gravano too, who are just, there's no empathy. The guy will will kill you and not even think twice about it. But his whole mentality too was that uh, it was his job. He's like, I'm doing my job. That's all. That's how he basically put it off in his brain as to where he didn't feel bad about it's it. It's the oath that they take. If you become yeah. a conducted member, those are the rules of the game. Period. 
uh, Gravano yeah. became a witness, so he revealed that. But those are the rules. Yeah. There's some of the recordings, too, made, like when we're talking about the Albanian massacre. The guys in the recordings were talking about there's not a lot of guys in this life that can do this. So they're identifying weakness in their own criminal organization because of, you know, the fear that they're going to get killed after they participate. So there's a lot of moving parts to that life. And a, a bright street guy knows when you're approaching them for cooperation, the reality of it. And it's like, what's in it for if you love your kids and you love your family, the reality may be it's time to cooperate and get off the street and get them in a, a different lifestyle. You know, I can always understand guys loyal from being there back decades ago because of maybe abuse that they felt discrimination from being an Italian or something like that. But the logic on so many levels of, you know, do you really want this life for your kids? Uh, I mean, it's one thing to be a contractor making money and just sort of going along to generate money for your business and your family uh, and pretty much being a sheep. But you can profit joining the life and making an oath to kill if asked and leave your you know wife or your child's deathbed uh to go participate in a murder i mean it's sort of juvenile to me the reality of it all because again the longer you're in the life the more hypocrisy you know about it and it also helps uh, show the treachery uh, of, of of the life because it has certainly happened that guys are assigned murders and if the murder goes bad, they're killed in punishment for it and to uh, get rid of uh, the trail. And even in some successful cases, the murderers are then killed by their own family to help cover up the paper trail. So it's a, it's a really hazardous assignment. And a lack of trust. What do you guys think about, so with the evolution of, of podcasting and YouTube now, there are some pretty big name people who have YouTube channels or podcasts. Uh, Michael Franzese and, and Sammy the Bull. What do you guys think about them kind of coming out? I mean, Sammy, I mean, he just got out of prison, what, like a few years ago, I think, three or four years ago. And he immediately took to the social media aspect. And I mean, if, if you do it right, it's a great moneymaker and it's legit. But what what are your guys' thoughts on some of these? I don't really guys? support a, a Sammy okay. Battles podcast. I don't watch it. I mean, I've watched a few to compare mm -hmm. how he talks today to like the Diane Sawyer interview. Yes. And you almost came across as a braggart back then and cites how he's, which I found funny about how he wasn't involved in narcotics. He wouldn't be involved with those drugs, uh, drug dealers. He was making that didn't age well, did it? <laughs> and, and look at what he got arrested for in the future. And I, and I remember... You know, I say when I went to, to interview him on the narcotics case that I was looking at regarding this capo in the Bensonhurst area, and that's his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I asked him, well, how did he make money? Oh, I don't know. I could ask a 10 year old kid in the neighborhood and they would say narcotics. And so at that point, it was like the shortest interview of a cooperator for me. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to put a liar in the stand and I'm not going to go through, you know, a circle jerk with this guy. So me and my partner, Doherty, we just sort of left and, and left. The thing that, you know, jumped out, well, his handling aide, George Gabriel, uh, Matty Tricarica, and Frankie Spiro, these were the FBI agents that were, you know, basically handled. I have total respect for them. I mean, he served their purpose, their case, well. And I do think that his cooperation was a combination of Al Diarco's cooperation but at the same time, I think he looked back on Maddie uh, and Frank, respected them uh, because of a member of his family died. And they basically, after ceremony and everything, they passed on their condolences to hit him for this passing of this relative. I don't know if it was a mother or father. So he respected that. There was a comfort zone with uh, cooperating there. But, you know, I... Doherty subsequently was part of a security detail uh, for Gravano after he was off the street. And this was a partner I thoroughly enjoyed. He's from Boston. He's blunt. And Gravano got the impression he didn't like him when they were. And he said, you're right. I don't like you. <laughs> and, which, you know, Doherty is pretty blunt. I got a kick out of that. 
It's all right. What do you think about all that, Dan? All these, uh, you know, the former mobsters and stuff like that starting to get more public and telling their stories. Yeah, I don't really pay any attention to any of it. I, you know, I spend enough time doing this kind of work that I don't feel any reason to listen to them talk about it. So I'm speaking from a vacuum of information, but to the degree that they expose treachery, hypocrisy, make it less appealing uh, because yeah. of flex reality, then I think it's a good thing. But if it's kind of like trading stories about, oh, wow, look at what wonderful tough guys we were um, and, and all the the things that we did that you should aspire to, then then it's a horrible message. I can agree with that. That's a good, uh, that's a good point of view because they do. I mean, I listen to them depending on what what the topic is a lot of times but they do actually talk quite a bit about some of the hypocrisy and oh, good. all the backstabbing and everything like that so that is a good point of view right there but uh with that being said Mike and Dan if you could tell me and my listeners one thing about this book that'll make them want to buy it what would that be there is a scandal that we don't address that's in the book and it'll be in the book. We we've got the book, uh, the pre-publication from the FBI came back. And so I think they'd be very interested in that. It's a headache for me because I found out after I left the bureau, what was going on. It's extortion type of conduct. And I would have loved to have the person arrested. For me, it's, um, I would say, if your listeners are interested in learning about the real mafia from people who were deeply embedded uh, from a law enforcement perspective in investigating and prosecuting them at the highest levels in the country, this is a fascinating read. If you're interested in true crime, fascinating read. Uh, if you like interesting and entertaining stories, this is up there. And we embed humor in there as well because Mike and I, we just like to laugh a lot. And uh, <laughs> so it's not, you know, it's not a somber kind of like buckle yourself yeah. in for the horror. I mean, there's that for sure. But there we we also try to make it very uh, human. So um, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but that's yeah. that's yeah. Yeah, it does, actually. And, and speaking of which, what was uh, what was one of the one of the funniest parts of your guys's career working with the mob just one thing that stands out that you still think about that you just laugh i have a funny story because i remember a <laughs> bank robbery agent coming up to my me and my desk saying i have a witness of a bank robbery who appears in your case file and i said what's the name they said carmine polito i go he's not a witness he's the bank robber <laughs> and it was you know it, it was a comical the look is like a deer in headlights. What do you mean? And basically the bank that was located next to his pizzeria was robbed. And apparently when I told him to go back and look at the details of when he opened his safety deposit box, which I think the bank robbers stored their guns to come into, it was a comical moment because when you look at the bank robbery and I see the photos from the bank robbery cameras, I can see, you know, be like uh looking at me with a baseball cat on and glasses coming into the bank. It's not hard to figure out who the bank robbers were. <laughs> and so there are some funny stories. I had a van on Mulberry Street where I was trying to get, originally I was a distance away just photographing the guys frequenting the social club, but eventually I had the van located right outside the social club and the bank robbers came out and started talking about bank robbery and referring to my van. We need a van like this. I've been in shootouts before. It was comical. <laughs> Um, for me, I, I could, there's one probably that stands out as the funniest for me. So I was preparing Mike Cookie Durso to testify at trials. This is the guy who was the undercover operative who took, who helped Mike Campy take down the, you know, arguably the biggest uh, undercover operation in law enforcement history. So I was spending a lot of time with him. He was in what's called a safe house, uh, a house where he and his family wouldn't be killed because obviously the mob was looking to kill him. And I would go out there on the weekends and spend uh, weekends with him and his family preparing him for a trial. And at one of those meetings, they were he and his dad were saying how much they missed New York pastries. Uh, so I said, hey, guys, you know, I'll I'll go. I'll pick up whatever you want. And, uh, and I'll bring it out on Saturday morning or Sunday, whatever. So they told me the name of some pastry. And I ended up going to Nero's Bakery in the city. 
And I couldn't remember what they said, but to the best of my memory, I asked the guy for Schwangul. And the, the guy behind the pastry uh, <laughs> looks at me like I'm an imbecile and he hands me something. So I'm like, okay, great, I got it. So I drive out to Durso and his dad and his family the, uh, the next morning and I say, hey guys, here's the Schwangul that you asked for. And I'm very proud of myself. And he and his father look at each other and they start bursting to laughter. They go, what did you just say? And I said, you asked me for Schwangul, here it is. And they go, Dan, that's F you in Italian. That's fuck you that I had just said. They had asked for Schwoyatel. But in my head, it had somehow transitioned into shrug you. So they just, they, they were doubled over, crying with laughter. And then the end to the story is 20 years later, for complicated reasons, Durso and Mike Campy and I started to spend some time together. This is 20 years after. And one of the first things Durso brings up to me, he's like, Dad, do you remember Shrangul? And he and I start <laughs> laughing. So every conversation after that, virtually every conversation, whoever got in the first word, either me or Durso, would be, hey, Shrangul, how you doing? That is awesome, dude. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys have any uh, anything planned for the future, like book-wise or anything like that, going uh, around speaking or anything? I think some airplugs, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the answer to that, is a little bit circuitous, but there's a long tail to this, Justin. And uh, there were a lot of movie and, and, and television people very interested in this. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. And they've kind of resurfaced. So I don't know if it will go anywhere, but that's that's uh, being discussed actively right now. And I'm joking about the hair plugs. I'm not going to waste that money. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that is outstanding. Fellas, I thank you so much for spending a Saturday with me for a couple hours. And, you know, if you want to, you're always welcome to come back on together, individually, whatever, to talk about anything. Um, even if you want to promote the book more, I'm totally cool with that. But uh, I can't thank you guys enough, man. Yeah, it's, so, absolutely. It. Thank you, Justin. Can we just uh, get out the name of the book? It's it's called War Against absolutely. the Mafia. And it's available on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, yep. any any of those kind of places. And if you just put War Against the Mafia, it should pop up. And uh, you can pre-order it. It's coming out in uh, a few weeks. But yep. you can uh, click on pre-order. Here's a thought on, on possibly coming back, if this makes sense to you. If your readers come back with, like, I wish you had asked ABC and there are no... I think Mike and I would be happy to do follow-up answers to those questions. That will definitely happen because people listen, they'll be like, oh man, you know, I didn't see the post asking about questions or something like that. Well, I, like I said, I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your Saturday and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. You too. Absolutely. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure and enjoy the weekend. Thank, thank you, gentlemen, so much. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. You guys take care too. Bye-bye.